Well, good morning, Walden Church. It's good to have you back. It's good to see you here on YouTube, online, in person. Thanks so much for attending. We are still in the middle of a sermon series on the seven woes of the religious leaders. What's that? Well, the seven woes were criticisms of Jesus, and they were against the current spiritual leaders of Jesus' time. And they were called this, they're called the seven woes, because every single time Jesus begins, he starts with the same three words, woe to you. Why is Jesus doing this? Well, Jesus was asked over to a meal at a religious leader's home. They were probably going to scope him out. Jesus wasn't content to sit and be grilled by them. So instead, he turns the meal on its head, and he's going to make the argument that they're the ones that actually need to check themselves. Today, we're at woe (laughs) number five. Now, why would we study this as a church? I mean, surely the Pharisees aren't around anymore. Surely their teaching died with them. I'd like to think so, but the truth is the teachers may have died, but the teaching lives on. Matthew 23, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. That is the opposite of how you should treat your dinner hosts. (laughs) If people invite you over for a meal, it's probably best not to compare them to a grave. These are the religious leaders of his day, and he calls them tombs. He calls them unclean graves. And tombs are not happy places, they represent death. But more so he calls them whitewashed tombs. So what is all that about? Well, this is a reference to a tradition that would happen during Passover. Passover is a huge celebration. People from all over would look forward to attending it. You and your family would make this massive road trip to Jerusalem just to attend. But there's one caveat. During the trip, you and your family have to do everything you can to remain ceremonially clean. Because if you mess up along the way, ate the wrong thing, touched the wrong thing, did the wrong thing, Then when you got to Jerusalem, you'd have to place yourself in quarantine. And you wouldn't be able to enter the celebration. You'd be inside, you'd be in lockdown, and you wouldn't be having fun with everybody else. So why does Jesus compare them to tombs? Well, bodies are traditionally buried outside of town, okay? And they're outside the city walls, which means that people coming into town had to be careful about where they stepped. Why? It's an Old Testament verse, Numbers chapter 19. Whoever in the open field touches someone who was killed with a sword or who died naturally or touches a human bone or a grave shall be unclean seven days. So this is one of the laws that the Pharisees live by. You can't touch or be near a grave. And Jesus has already spoken to them about how rigid and how legalistic they are with the law. You know, there's actually a story about a legalistic seminary student who wanted to have a scriptural basis for every single thing he did. He felt that he had to be on solid ground and whatever he did or said had to be in the book, right? Had to be in the Bible, chapter and verse. He did all the right things. Well, he started to fall in love with a beautiful girl at school, and he wanted very much to kiss her. But he couldn't find a scripture verse that would let him. So true to his conscience that he would walk her to the dormitory every night, look at her longingly, and then just say goodnight. This went on for weeks, and he kept searching the Bible, trying to find some scripture verse that said it was okay to kiss her. But he couldn't find one until... He found a passage in Romans which said, greet each other with a holy kiss. He thought, at last, I have found the passage and the authority that will allow me to kiss her goodnight. 
But to be sure, he went to his professor just to check it out. And after talking, he realized the passage was really more for the church and not dating. So once again, he simply didn't have a passage of scripture that would allow him to kiss his girl goodnight. That evening, he walked her to her dormitory. Once again, he said goodnight. But as he did, she grabbed him, pulled him to her, and she planted a 10-second kiss right on his lips. At the end of the kiss, the seminary student gasped for air and said, Bible verse, Bible verse. The girl grabbed him a second time, and just before kissing him again, she said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. <laughs> back, to the, back to the graves. <laughs> so with so many graves that are that close to the temple, what they would do is they would hire Gentiles to go out into the fields and they would paint all of the tombs with white lime so that incoming travelers would see the tombs and avoid them and stay clean. Of course, year after year, the rains and weather would wash the white away, and so this was a tradition that had to be done every single year. And so far, what we've seen from Jesus is, at this meal, he's constantly comparing them to traditions or rituals that they observe. He's compared them to the cup washing and the hand washing. He's talked about their eating habits. He's compared them to um, being two-faced, right? And now he's comparing them to another practice. Jesus is taking something the Pharisees did as part of their religious practice, and he's turning it into a metaphor for their life. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Just like he did with the cup and dish, just like he did when he called them two-faced, Jesus calls them out and he says, you have a good appearance on the outside, but something is altogether different on the inside. But this time, it just seems really offensive because Jesus says inside they are like corpses, like rotting flesh, like death. And it really seems like Jesus is beating this drum a lot why is he so adamant about repeating this point to them over and over? Well, it has a lot to do with their motivation, why they do the things that they do, the reason they celebrate, the reason they worship, the reason they obey. Jesus is making an argument about the religious leaders and how they just want the job. They just want the title. They just want the wardrobe and the money and the status. It's like they want to be famous, and what that represents. Look at what Jesus teaches in Matthew 6. He says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Jesus warns, practicing your righteousness. In other words, the things you do, the things that set you apart, your worship, okay, the religious life that you choose, Jesus says, you do it not to help, not because you love God, but because you want to be seen. Verse 2 says, thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. It's very possible that the Pharisees, when they would walk through an impoverished neighborhood, they would literally blow a trumpet to alert people to come out into the streets to receive alms. Jesus said, you already got the reward that you wanted. You seem only interested in the earthly reward. This is why Jesus hits this nail over and over and over again, because it is something that he sees repeated by them again and again. Here is, here's another moment, okay? Here's another moment where Jesus speaks about the same exact issue. Luke 18, he also told this parable to some, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Yeah, I wonder who that is. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, bingo, and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this bleh, tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. 
Here, Jesus makes a caricature of a Pharisee. He says, this is your typical Pharisee. Someone who is just bragging to God about how self-righteous they are. God, thank you so much. I am not like other people. Jesus says, these are supposed to be religious people that, that you think are acting right, walking right, doing what they're supposed to be doing. But I say they're also filled with contempt. Remember, Jesus starts off this whole conversation, the whole seven woes, by saying, don't act like them. Don't look up to them. They don't practice what they preach. Here's another time. Jesus has a conversation with a Pharisee. Luke 10, and behold, a lawyer, that'd be somebody familiar with the Old Testament law, right? Stood up and put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, meaning the Pharisee, desiring to justify himself. Justify who? Himself, right? So this conversation that he's having with Jesus is very one-sided, right? Don't even really think he's really interested in having a conversation. He's trying to prove himself, he's trying to make himself look right. Said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he sat him on his own animal, brought him into an inn, took care of him, and the next day he took out two denarii and gave those to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Now, which of the three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers. Now watch this. The Pharisee says, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Jesus told a story, and then he asked a follow-up question. He said, which one proved to be a neighbor? Right? But Jesus tricked his listener because he didn't name his characters. He didn't give them names. He called them by very generic names. A priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan were going for a walk. Two temple employees and a half-breed. Two religious people and your enemy. In Jesus' story, it's the Samaritan who is able to rise above bigotry, rise above centuries of prejudice, and who shows mercy and compassion for an injured Jew when after the Jew's own countrymen passed him by. And Jesus says, okay, you tell me, who acted like a neighbor? Who fulfilled the law? And what does the religious leader say? The one who showed him mercy. This is how much this man hates Samaria. He can't even bring himself to say the name of their race out loud because the Pharisees hated the Samaritans. He loves God loves his job, loves his position, loves his title. He can't bring himself to love the common people. Jesus says, y'all are beautiful tombs. <laughs> you carry your Bible to church, you wear your suit and tie, you have your nice clean haircut, your pretty iron dress, your perfectly combed pigtails, but inside I see, I see what's going on. I see your darkness. He said, you're full of hypocrisy. You're full of lawlessness. Jesus said, you look real on the outside, but inside you're fake and plastic and broken and dead. Let's go back to the tombs for a second. They're whitewashed with lime. Inside the tomb, of course, there is a dead body. And the white paint is a danger sign. Don't go over there. Don't step there. Watch out for death. The paint serves as a warning. Now, some warning signs are dumb. Like the label on the bottle of peanuts that say this container might contain nuts. Or the hairdryer warning that says 
You shouldn't use it while sleeping or in the bathtub. The label on the iron that says, do not iron shirt while wearing. Here, I'm gonna to read to you an instruction from Paul. Paul's gonna give instructions to his Christian disciple, Timothy, and he offers his own warning about caring for the inside. And he says, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching, persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Paul says, watch out. There are graves in your own life. There are things in our own life that we should paint and pay attention to. And the first one, he says, is be mindful of yourself. Right off the bat, be mindful of yourself, watch out, which means we can govern ourselves. You know, we might wanna blame circumstance or genetics or other people all we want all day long, but the truth is we have to take responsibility of what is going on in our own life. So when Paul says, watch yourselves, we need to look. We need to look inside our thoughts, inside our feelings and determine, okay, where am I? Take a spiritual inventory and see if this is where God wants me to be. The book of Proverbs says, better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked in all his ways. I highly doubt that the rich, crooked Pharisees lived by this verse. Paul says, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. In other words, be mindful of your belief. Sometimes we hear words like doctrine and theology and we think, well, those are just big, scary Bible words and only pastors and teachers use those. Yeah, but Paul's warning to Timothy is to watch what we believe, watch what we teach, and, and make sure that the things that we talk about and say and spread are the truth and that they agree with God's word. Second Peter 3 says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I highly doubt that the stuck up Pharisees felt like they had room to grow, that they had more to learn. We should never tire of learning. We should never be in a situation where we think we know it all. Just a little self-examination to watch ourselves, watch our beliefs, and have those things painted white so that we remember what's important. Our faith needs to be on purpose. We have to live deliberately for God. We shouldn't allow the Christian life to just happen to us. We should not be passive believers. It's not que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. Living for Jesus takes active, daily participation from us. We have to wake up every day with the intent to love God more, to love one another more. And like Jesus' parable about the, the Samaritan, love our enemy more. What's the next thing Paul says? Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching and persist in this. In other words, persevere. Don't give up. Don't stop. Don't quit. John Wesley was an English cleric. He was a theologian. He was an evangelist. He was also the leader of a revival in the modern Church of England known as Methodist. Without him, no Methodist churches. I want to read to you entries from his own journal. The year 1738, Sunday, May 7th, preached in St. Lawrence's, was asked not to come back anymore. Sunday, p.m., May 7th, preached at St. Catherine Cree's church. Deacon said, get out and stay out. Sunday, a.m., May 14th, preached at St. Anne's, can't go back there either. Sunday afternoon, May 21st, preached at St. John's, kicked out again. Sunday evening, May 21st, preached at St. somebody else's, Bennett's maybe, deacons called special meeting and said I couldn't return. So the May month of the year 1738 was bad. <laughs> Lots of rejection. Anybody else might have given up and probably said, you know, this preaching thing, eh, I don't know, maybe it's not for me. Let's look at another, the following year, 1739. Tuesday, May 8th, afternoon service, preached in a pasture in Bath, 1,000 people came to hear me. 
Sunday, September 9th, preached to 10,000 people three weeks in a row in Moorfields. What a difference. That's a journal entry. 1,000 people and then 10,000 people? That's encouraging. This is why we stick with it. This is why we don't give up. If he had given up in 1738, we'd have no Methodist churches today. But then watch what happens in 1742, which comes later. 1742, Friday, March 10th, preached in Meadow, chased out of Meadow as a bull was turned loose during the services. Popular and good enough that 10,000 people came out to hear him, and then two years later, somebody set a bull loose in church. <laughs> okay, so now, now give up. No, no, persevere, right? Be mindful of yourself, of your beliefs, and persevere. Notice that Paul's instructions to Timothy are a checklist of what's in here, right? What's inside to protect ourselves from vanity, pride, arrogance, self-deceit, and like Jesus says, hypocrisy. When Samuel was looking for the next king of Israel, Samuel was looking for king qualities, ruggedness, right? Height, handsomeness, and he was going down the list, going down the row of men, available candidates. Samuel 16, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on his height or his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Just like how Jesus could see through the Pharisees, he sees what we don't see. He knows what we don't know. I want to remind you that there is a greater, more powerful work going on in your life. Jesus shines his light on our lives to where no human eye can see. When Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee and he saw Simon and Andrew casting their nets in the sea, he saw fishermen. And we would have seen fishermen. But Jesus says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus didn't see smelly, or blue collar, or low income, or life going nowhere, or young, naive. He saw future possibilities. He saw greatness. He saw potential. And ultimately, he saw students who would never quit even to the point of death. And this is exactly what I want Jesus to see when he looks at you. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather as a church, whether it's online or in person. We know that where we gather together, you are there. We continue to pray for the health and wellness of our community through Montgomery, through Texas, and to the ends of the earth. Please rid the world of this horrible disease. Bring health and healing to those who are sick. Cure those that are on our hearts and on our minds and be with those who are currently suffering over the loss of loved ones. Lord, we thank you for each and every blessing. We pray your protection over our students and school teachers as they return to school. Keep our first responders safe and thank you for every blessing of wealth and health that we get to experience in our lives. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks everybody for watching. Don't forget, this is a YouTube video with a link. You can copy that link and post it to your own Facebook wall. You can share it to your friends and neighbors or share it to the neighbor's wall of someone who you think might be encouraged by this message today. Thanks guys, I love you.